I would like to welcome you all to the Thursday uh, night Genealogy Club. Um, this is our lecture presentation evening. We also meet for those who are available to me every Thursday. We also have a Tuesday night lecture series, and it's important to look at our website. We have little bookmarks and things up there. We've got some wonderful upcoming topics on the Tuesday night, the first Tuesday of each month. We have Thursday night programming as well. So um, I would like for you all to check those out because we, and if you haven't signed our guest list, if you put your email on it, if we do not have it, we will send you a little email on these presentations, and many of them are wonderful. Tonight's presentation is very exciting to me because it, it, uh, it will involve a topic that is uh, a very good reason for genealogy other than that it enriches your family heritage and also it gives closure on things for that. This is something that is of the vital uh, aspect which is diseases and how they're passed on and stuff like that and it's kind of important at times uh, in your lives to know what your grandparents, great grandparents, what, what they finally died of. Tonight, uh, we have a great lady who is uh, going to talk about this. And I, so I've been talking with her on the phone, and uh, she's going to discuss even personal uh, part of this. So, and she's going to tell you why it's so important to know. But you're, that's why the title, Can Genealogy Kill You? Well. The lack of not knowing can kill you. But uh, there are many important things dealing with the, the role of health and inherited dis diseases. And uh, also, we will deal with, in this presentation, DNA. And that's, that becomes something that is more special, I think, as we go along because I have great hopes for the future of DNA and what it will hopefully tell us in the future and keep growing in the cutting edge of wisdom and research there. Well, uh, our speaker tonight holds a Bachelor of Science from West Virginia State University and an MALS from Hollins College in Virginia. And uh, while working on a second master, she become ill, and I'm going to let her discuss that part of it. But I, I would like for you all to make welcome uh, our speaker for tonight, Nancy Sparks Morris. hear me if I try without this, and I'm going to just kind of balance myself on this stool. I've had a, a little bit of an illness, so uh, I'll just be kind of very casual and I'm speaking with you tonight. I'm just delighted to be here. Um, I wanted to uh, show you something that you probably have seen. Uh, the paper yesterday had actually four articles on health. 24% of residents in fair or poor health survey finds. Lawmakers urged to target chronic illnesses. So it's, this is a very important uh, area of research and knowledge that's going on now, not just because of genealogy, but because of income and because of money <laughs> problems and health insurance and all the sort of things that go along with this. Now let me say first of all, I'm not a doctor. I don't diagnose or prescribe anything. And the reason I got into this, well I did want to be a doctor when I was a little girl. I went to see my family doctor 
he said, now Nancy, your mom and dad aren't very well to do and you would get into pre-med or med school about halfway and you would meet somebody and fall in love and you would run away and get married and have kids and all that education would go to waste. All right, aren't we glad that things have changed a little bit in the time period? Uh, this is the thing that he said, be a nurse. And while I appreciate nurses, I didn't want to be a nurse. So then I got the acting bug and I decided that after high school, I was going to go to New York City and become another Sarah Bernhardt. My mother said, absolutely, positively, you are not going to live in that simple city of New York by yourself at 18. And so I didn't go to New York City. So then I decided, I would be uh, away. I would join the Navy and I would see the world. And my mother said, you are not going to be anywhere near all those men. <laughs> so I didn't become away. I went to Marshall and I started in the education area. I, I majored, in, first of all, in speech and drama and a minor in French and I also had a minor in history. Uh, I had been the child who had done genealogy from the time I was a little child. Uh, my cousins would say, Nancy, come on out and play. And I'd say, oh, no, no, no. And I'd sit and listen to the aunts and uncles talk, who did this to what, who married who, and who died, why they died, all of these good things that I just found fascinating. So I didn't start writing things down, of course, until I was older. And I had to, to use my dad and my mom's help and some of the aunts and uncles, just like most of you do. So I want to talk to you a little bit. I'm not going to get into any scientific part about DNA. Uh, I'm going to talk to you more on a little bit of the historical part of the thing that I find interesting. But just so that we all are on the same page, you all know that elephants have baby elephants, giraffes have baby giraffes, dogs have dogs, and so on, every type of living creature. Uh, there are a couple of things, like a horse and a zebra, that uh, uh, we may find a little cross, but most everything is there. So why does this happen or not happen? And the answer, answer is this little molecule that has a nice long scientific name that's abbreviated to DNA. And this DNA contains every one of the biological instructions that make each species unique. And it contains instructions that are passed from adult organisms down to the offspring during reproduction. What it does is that it helps an, an organism develop, survive, and reproduce itself. Um, this DNA with the instructions that it contains is passed from adult organisms to their offspring and it functions and it must be converted into messages that are used to produce certain proteins, which are the complex molecules that do most of the work in our bodies that help our organs grow and help us develop. Uh, if you're interested in DNA, there is a book that was written several years back by uh, Brian Sykes from Oxford University called The Seven Daughters of Eve. Uh, there are more daughters of Eve now than there were when he wrote it, but at first he, he defined all of us as having descended from one of these seven daughters of Eve. Uh, it's easy reading, and it's not real technological, and I highly recommend it will give you just a little basis that if you're interested in this, you can start out with there. Uh, I have had several DNA tests done, and there's actually two kinds. One kind of DNA you have done for health issues and the other kind of DNA you have done to research family connections. Uh, this is where paternity tests came from. Uh, a woman can find out who her father is biologically by testing for paternity. They do, you've seen it on TV, those little swabs in your mouth, they send it off to a lab, the, the father does the same thing and they can say with 99.99% accuracy, yes or no, to the father. This is the father of that person. But to do beyond her father, a woman cannot do that. 
it takes a male member of the family, either a sibling or a cousin, to trace a, a male line on back through the ages. Women have what's called maternal DNA. And I've had my maternal DNA tested, and that was the first one that I had tested through Oxford Ancestry. Uh, my uh, maternal DNA, they tell me, began with one of the seven daughters of Eve that Brian Sykes named Jasmine. Jasmine lived in the Syrian plains around 14,000 years ago. The clan that she produced traveled through what's now Armenia, Turkey, Greece, before spreading all over Europe and throughout the world. Now, I have genealogically traced through records only a very small part, a portion of this, of course. I want to give you the surnames that I know are in these. These are all <coughs> maternal mothers of my mother's line going straight back. Uh, her mother was a Carrie. Her mother was a Napier. Uh, in Roman County, they sometimes called it Napper down there. Uh, her mother was a Queen. Her mother was a Murphy. And that line ends with Murphy in around 1800. And I've not been able to find any genealogical record of the family line, the maternal family line going beyond that. So you can see from 14,000 years ago with Jasmine and the Syrian plains, there's kind of a large gap. But the DNA tells you that that is exactly where your line comes from. I had my daddy's maternal DNA done. And men can have their maternal DNA done. But he had already passed away at the time that I did that. And so I used his sister and had her check. Now, her maternal DNA shows the origin in the area that's now Venice, Italy. Uh, you may remember having seen in the newspaper several years back about the ice man that was found in the Alps, supposed to have lived around 5,000 years ago. He's my dad's cousin. <laughs> so we have this line, and these are the maternal surnames that trace back. Hager, Music, Collins, Cunningham, Countess, Burt, and Swift. And that ends up about 1760, and I've not been able to go back any further on that line to see where that goes. Um, this um, is, is an interesting observation, I think. Your community tells you who you are. Your community says you are white, you are black, you are a mulatto, you are octoroon, whatever the, the situation has been over the years. But it's your DNA that tells you exactly who you are and where you came from. Um, I want you to remember this as I go on a little bit. I am a little white girl, whatever that means, born in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia, and I have family from North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky, and West Virginia for 300 years. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what my maternal DNA and what my profile, aside from the maternal DNA, that line goes straight back. Your paternal line goes straight back. But there's something called a fingerprint DNA that can tell you what different lines are and it matches you to populations in different areas of the world so that you know that you most your genetic makeup most resembles other people in this world. Uh, I, I, I've tried to make some copies of this and my, my copy ran out of color ink so I'll, I'll let you have a look at this later but this is the cell nucleus, this is the DNA, scientists call this the double helix. We all have it and this is where we come from with standard scientific procedures. Okay, when I had my fingerprint DNA done, some of my cousins were not very happy. Okay, the personal DNA analysis that came to me said that my principal ancestry is Africa. And it contained Western European, chiefly Irish, and with a Middle Eastern portion. 
Our family had said that we were English, Irish, maybe some German, and a Native American grandmother or two. Okay? I have also some possibility of Jewish ancestors because I have some ancestry matches in some Spanish areas. The Menorthans, the Moroccan Berbers of North Africa, and some former Portuguese colonies uh, where there were known Jewish uh, settlements. Uh, the thing that I find interesting is that they have matched me up with this African ancestry as Guinea Bissau, Africa, and the North Moroccan Berbers. They were the slave Berbers and the slaves. I have no idea, nobody in my family ever knew anything about this, I had no idea, you know, this is, this is the thing that some of my cousins did not like me telling them. This is, oh no, not me, not me. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting, the ancestor, the European ancestry, which is actually less than the African ancestry, was found in southern France, and I have several families that are supposed to be French families. Remy, Remy, Purdue, Pardue, uh, Belcher, Belchier. So there are several families that I, I knew, I haven't gotten them over to France, but I knew they were supposed to have a French background. Uh, but the interesting thing that came about this is that, that my mother's paternal uh, father's surname was Mayo, M-A-Y-O. Uh, we were told that Mayo is Irish. And I guess because of County Mayo, Ireland, I, I don't know, but that we always thought that was the Irish connection. Well, it turns out that Mayo in this line goes back to France, M-A-Y-I-E-U-X, still pronounced Mayo. And that's interesting enough because all of these Belchers and these Purdue's all intermarry with this Mayo line. So I don't know whether it's something genetic that pulls you to people who are similar to you or whether they knew something about having come from various areas. But this is a, a nice little thought to, to think, okay, here we have this little genetic French girl who falls in love with this little genetic French boy and you know, they, get, they get married and live happily ever after. Um, this is uh, a, a, an interesting thing to me. So I, I went back with this Mayo from France and there are certain numbers and letters that they give you that you can match up. And I got those from the Mayo in France and looked at them. And it goes back to a group of Turkey-like people who lived in Russia. I think it was about 16,000 years ago. They were a warlike and idolatrous clan of people. Uh, they did speak a kind of Turkish language, but they also, some of them spoke Russian. And that clan of people, somehow or other, transpired from that area across the Mediterranean and up into France, became the Mayo group there, became my Mayo family here. Uh, so we can, we can trace and find out. I, I like the part about the warlike people because I, I kind of thought I fit my, my Mayo clan. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, it appears that I have no Eastern Asian ancestry, and I have no subcontinental Indian ancestry. And there is a slight indication that I have an American Indian admixture that he thinks probably is likely Lumbee Indian of North Carolina. And if you know the actress Heather Locklear, she's Lumbee. Uh, so this is, this is the, the thing. This may have had the connection. My great-grandmother, whom I knew, uh, said that she was a quarter strain Native American, and I believe she said Cherokee, but I was little and I'm not real sure about that. I've done her genealogy, and the most she possibly could be is 164th Native American. This is the line that I think goes back to the African ancestry. 
And I think the Native American at that time that my great grandmother lived was a better reason for her slightly darker. Well, her, her skin was kind of like when you got stained oak and walnuts. She was beautiful. She was a tiny little woman, probably about five feet tall. Probably didn't weigh 90 pounds, ring and rip and wet. Had long, straight hair that she parted in the middle, braided, and then put up in a bun on the back of her head. So I loved her, and but I was scared of her because she was the Indian in the family. And the only thing I knew was that there were those Indians that had those bows and arrows, and they were shooting all the white folk around, and I was one of them. So it's, it's interesting. Um, all right, so you need to do your DNA. And let me just kind of go over a little bit why. First of all, it's medically important. I, I've given you some idea of why it's genealogically interesting. And you can find cousins, distant cousins, via this genetic matching. Um, one of my, my friends who has done this uh, had a family line, let's just call it Jones, that one he was tracing all the way back. And when he got so far back tracing that, he found these folks that were not named Jones, and they had the same ancestors that he did. So somewhere along the line, there was a non-paternal event, <laughs> or somebody married somebody else that wasn't recognized and they didn't know about. And so he has cousins, and not that far apart cousins, who have two different names from what his family had and it looks like it goes back to his great-grandfather. So you, you can travel. Okay, you need a family medical history. If your doctor has not asked you for your family's medical history, you need to get a new doctor. This is my personal opinion, okay? I'm not a doctor, I can't diagnose and prescribe, but I have been through this and I know a lot of other people who have. There are uh, spots and I have some handouts to give you with URLs on them that you can download forms to complete a, a medical pedigree, a medical information form, and most of us can at least go back three generations and find uh, health issues in our family using family bibles, using census records, using obituaries, using the death records, social security, some of those things are all a part of how you can look at and find uh, what actually caused uh, the death of some of your ancestors. This grandmother that I told you about, uh, her death certificate said that she died of dementia. Well, I remember, as I said, I remember her. She had these huge, big, black melanomas all over her head, and I suspect other parts of her body as well and she wore the long sleeves and the long skirts and we didn't never see that. So I know that she didn't die of dementia, she had some sort of a cancer and of course it got into her brain and, and that would indeed cause you to be demented. But you have to be careful and I have something on that that I'm gonna to give to you later too. That's a handout that talks about old fashioned medical terms for a variety of different diseases and what we call them now. And that's very interesting to look into too because there are a lot of things that, that they talk about that we don't you know, have any idea of what they were doing. Families have some factors in common and they have their genes, but they also have their environment and they have their lifestyle. And all three of these things can give you some clues and some information to medical conditions that can run in your family. These can can be inherited, but they also can be environmental or an inherited illness that is started or triggered by something environmental or by something like a lifestyle. Uh, a family medical history can tell you if you have a higher than usual chance of heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, certain cancers, and diabetes. Uh, these are all complex disorders and they're influenced by a combination of different genetic factors and environmental conditions and lifestyle choices. So a family history can provide you with that answer. 
but it can also give you information about the risk of a more rare condition that's caused by mutations in a single gene. I have an inherited illness that is caused by mutations, and they believe that it takes a gene from each parent. Um, I'll talk more about this personally a little bit later on. We had no idea, of course, as I said, with the ancestry that I thought I had, uh, it, no one would have thought to look. So you know, if you know your family medical history, then you can take some steps to reduce your risk. Uh, if you're at a certain risk of cancer, then you may want to have more frequent screenings, you may want to be sure you're not smoking, uh, you may want to have regular checkups or testing uh, for medical conditions that run in your family that you know about. And lifestyle changes, such as just simple things like developing a healthier diet, getting regular exercise, quitting smoking, uh, control the drinking, that sort of thing can help lower chances of developing some of these illnesses, such as heart disease and other things. So the easiest way to get information, of course, is from your relatives. And if you have any family reunions, it's really neat to take a, a medical form to the family reunion and ask the members of each family section if they would be willing to fill this out. And you would be willing to combine it and give them back a copy of it because it would be just as useful to them as it would be to you. Uh, you can use, as I said, uh, you can obtain medical records. Um, you can um, order documents uh, such as the obituaries and death certificates, uh, and all of these can help you complete a medical family history. So it's important that you keep it up to date for yourself and your children and grandchildren if you have them as well, so that you can start something that will be handed down as well as the genealogy of your family. Our Surgeon General has started a family health history initiative. It's been going on for a little bit. Um, there are some inheritable uh, illnesses, I mean, aside from heart disease and cancer, diabetes, things like that. Uh, hemophilia is a blood disorder, bleeding, uh, that can be handed down. Cystic fibrosis can be handed down. Sickle cell anemia can be handed down. And that's where the blood, uh, the cells, instead of being circular, uh, end up having a, a, a sickle shape. And they get caught in as they flow through your veins and everything backs up and you have a lot of inflammation swelling and it can be a fatal disease more black folks get that disease than white folks do and we still don't know why that is so but as i said with my ancestry saying that there's all this african ancestry there i could very well have had the sickle cell anemia and doctors would have looked at me and said oh you are amazing um, if one generation of your family has some high blood pressure, then the next generation of your family may have some high blood pressure. So tracing the illnesses that were suffered by your parents, and your grandparents, and other blood relatives can help you uh, predict, perhaps, which of those might be at risk for you and your family and take actions to keep you healthy. Uh, I, as I said, I have some uh, URLs for you, and I have the Surgeon General's uh, Health Initiative site and there are just loads and loads of URLs on there that will help you to do this. There is a, another site that gives a, a pedigree analysis of a genetic family history, and that's a, an easy one because we all know what, how the pedigrees look and what goes. You don't have to do a lot of writing on that one, and it can certainly be used to give you a start on that. And there is a site that I'm giving you about uh, are you at risk, and I am also giving you a site that tells you how to make a personal medical history form. Uh, there are places where you can download things and or print out things. Um, your family medical history provides some insight into conditions that are common in your family. And you can use this to give yourself clues about the risk. Uh, there are, here are the, the things that that can help you do. It can help you assess the risk for certain diseases. 
recommend treatments for changes in diet or lifestyle to reduce the risk of disease, determine which diagnostic tests needed to be ordered, determine the type and the frequency of various screening tests, determine whether you or family members should get a specific genetic test, identify a condition that might not otherwise be considered, and that's where I fell. Identify other family members who are at risk of developing a certain disease, and assess your risk of passing on these conditions to your children. Fortunately, both of my children seem to be healthy, and I have not passed this disease on to them. They may get other things, but they're not going to get that. Um, if you go to a family reunion, share the purpose of what you're doing, uh, and provide several different ways to answer questions. Uh, word the questions carefully. Uh, you don't want to insult anybody. You don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. And you need to be a good listener, and you need to respect the privacy of those individuals who are talking to you about their own health issues. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal health issue here. Um, I have been a busy person most of my life. I have done a lot of things, um, but I have been ill off and on throughout my whole life from the time I was 18 months old. My mother said that I had a very high fever that she remembered. I had some seizures. Um, I cried when they moved arms and legs. And they called the doctor. And back in those days, he even came to the house. And he came, and he there was a, a polio epidemic going on. And he told my mother that he thought I had a mild case of polio. Now, I had no residual polio after effects at all. And these little attacks happened every so often. Um, and one of, the, one of the neat things about these attacks that it also gave me pain in my right side, which was very similar to appendicitis. And my daddy's cure-all for anything that ailed you was milk of magnesia and castor oil. <laughs> All right, the doctor said, absolutely no milk of magnesia or castor oil for her any longer. And boy, did I like that. That, that, was, that was the best diagnosis I could have gotten at that point. I um, the disease that I have is called familial Mediterranean fever. Now, you, you hear fever and you think, you got to have a fever, and as I said, I did have some fever as a child. But my mother said that um, there were times where I acted like I had a fever, and she would take my temperature, and I did not. It was 98.6. Well, what has happened is that my normal temperature is 95.6. You know, 98.6 is just kind of an average, and not all of us have that temperature. So if I take my temperature and it's 98.6, I I have a fever. I'm sick. And this was the thing that we did not know until I began doing some research. And I was in my 50s when this happened. I had these things going on all of my life. Uh, there are many, many diagnoses. And I'm just going to show you what I have printed out here. Some of you may want to look at it. These are some of the diagnoses that I and others have been given who had this familial Mediterranean fever. You can see how many of them there are listed here. When I went back and started checking about myself, I had 17 different specific diagnoses, and I was taking 21 different medications several times a day each. For all intents and purposes, I was bedridden. I had had to leave my occupation because I couldn't tell my employer that I would be there every day and from the start to the end of the day. Uh, I have said that I hurt from the tip of my hair to the tip of my toes, and the only thing that I could move that did not hurt was my eyelids. Uh, there were so many of these diagnoses that started out, and I began doing a little research on each one of them. When I, had, I had, maybe I would have a half hour or an hour in the middle of the afternoon where 
I would feel a little bit better. And I had the computer, and so I could you know, research a little bit. So I had iritis, I had sinusitis, I had laryngitis, I had autolaryngitis, I had bronchitis, I had costochondritis, I had um, gastritis, I had gastroenteritis, I had pancreatitis, uh, I had arthritis, and somebody would, so sometimes the doctor would take the blood test, he'd say, oh, you've got rheumatoid arthritis. The next time I go, well, no, apparently you don't have a rheumatoid arthritis. Now, did anybody see a pattern in these things that I, I left off? Did you notice that everything that I mentioned ended in itis? Do you know what itis means? It means inflammation of. Inflammation of your sinus, inflammation of your eye, inflammation of your ears, inflammation of your larynx. That's all that it means. Does that help you? No. Because what caused all of this inflammation? So I, as I began doing some research, I recognized something that no doctor had ever told me. I had some sort of an inflammatory illness. Nobody is going to have all those various inflammations that there's not something else in, going on in the back. And so I began to, to look at to this. I also was still continuing to do my genealogy. I have spoken to various groups before about the Melungeons, and I have some URLs that I'm going to give you about them as well. We, we believe that the Melungeons are a multi-ethnic, multicultural group of people who have a Mediterranean ancestry. Uh, they're kind of controversial. Some folks don't believe that. They get mad. But this is what I believe and what has, the information I've found has led me to believe. And I believe that this is the line that goes through the African ancestry and into the Mediterranean. Uh, and that was why I had all the DNA done. Because I, when I found this illness, I went into my rheumatoid arthritis doctor, and I told him, I said, look, I think I have found out what's wrong with me. And he said, oh, you have? And I said, yes, I believe I have familial Mediterranean fever. And I was sitting up on his table, and he laughed at me. And he told me that there was not a thing wrong with me, that it was all in my head, and I needed to go see a psychiatrist. Well, I did go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> And after a few visits with the psychiatrist, he said, Nancy, there's nothing wrong with your head. There's something wrong with your body. So I don't know you know, what it is. He said, you need to continue going on. So I went to another doctor. And I actually went to four different doctors. And the fourth doctor, I told him, and the second one also laughed. But the fourth doctor, when I got to him, I said, okay, look, here's what I think. Don't laugh. Don't say anything until I finish telling you what this is. So I told him I thought I had familial Mediterranean fever. And he said, well, you know, that's a really rare disease. And I don't think you have that. And I said, well, will the, the medication that they give for that, will it hurt me if I take it and I don't have the disease? And he said, no. The medication is colchicine, and it's the common medication that's given for gout. People have taken it for 2,000 or more years. The doctors to the pharaohs gave it to them for their arthritic problems. It's made from the autumn crocus, and guess where the autumn crocus grows? In the Mediterranean. If you're going to have a Mediterranean disease, where do you think you might find something that would help? Okay. In the Mediterranean. So I, I, I began hearing more, a little more about the Melungeons and this Mediterranean connection. And down in Wise, Virginia, there was a group of folks who were doing some research on the Melungeons. One of them was Dr. N. Brent Kennedy. He's a wonderful man. Unfortunately, he's had a, a brain aneurysm. He's on life support and paralyzed, so his research is no longer able to go on. He's still living, and his, his folks say he's still in there. But they're trying to find some sort of way for him to communicate so that he can go on with research. And perhaps he's, he let them know he would like to write another book. His book is called The Melungeons, The Resurrection of a Proud People. Uh, it
it's, it's theories, and it's his genealogy. It's very easy to read, um, and he did not know anything about having this connection to these people, even though he lived in the area of Wise, and that's where they came from, and he lived there all his life. He began to connect them because he had been working down in Atlanta, Georgia, and all of a sudden he became deathly ill. And he went to an emergency room in Georgia, Atlanta, and there happened to be a doctor in there who was a Middle Eastern doctor. And the doctor looked at him and he said, I believe you have sarcoidosis. Now, sarcoidosis is not an inheritable disease that they know of yet, but they find that it does run in some families, and so they're still doing research on it. One of the major things that you can tell, it's, it's painful, you have arthritic like pain and all this sort of stuff, but you have these blisters that can be from the quarter size up to the silver dollar size. They're flat, they have little reddish centers and kind of yellow around the, the side out of there. They just come out ever so often and you will have them and some other pain and then they go away and you'll go on and have those and nothing happens and you'll have the same thing all over again. What are they called? Uh, sarcoidosis. S-A-R-C-O-I-D-O-S-I-S. -S sarcoidosis. It can be a fatal disease. It's not curable, but it is treatable. And uh, so this is the, the thing that uh, Brent came back. He left his job in Georgia and came back to Wise took a less stressful job and decided that he needed to look into his family because the doctor had said that he thought this was inherited and that it did run in families. Now, as I said, they don't really believe that it is inherited right now, but they do admit to it running in families. So, I, I, you know, more research. That's all we need. So, Brent went to a doctor in Kingsport, Tennessee. and. Uh, the doctors confirmed the sarcoidosis diagnosis. But Brent had some other symptoms that did not seem to fit with the sarcoidosis. And so the doctor began looking around and he found familial Mediterranean fever. And he told Brent, he said, you know, I, I, you can have more than one disease and I think this is what you have. So he put Brent on colchicine. Well, not only did it help the, the other symptoms that Brent had, it helped the sarcoidosis as well to some degree. So this little group of people that were re researching the Melungeons that were part of Brent's ancestry decided that they would like to get together and they had a little internet site. Oh, there probably wasn't more than 50 people on it when I first found it. <coughs> And so they said, okay, let's get together down in Wise and we're going to have a potluck. Everybody brings something to eat. When everybody arrived in Wise, Virginia, that little tiny town in far western Virginia, there were seven or eight hundred of them. Of course, you know what the internet does to things that go around. More and more folks. Well, they, the, the people that were arranging this down, they like to die. What are we going to do with all these people? So they quickly got some folks together who could speak about various and sundry things. Brent agreed at that time, that was before the aneurysm, he agreed that he would uh, speak on the sarcoidosis and the familial Mediterranean fever diagnosis, as well as his family. And I saw what he had put on the internet about FMF at that point. It's been research, hadn't come up with it. I went down the, 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 the list and I looked at that and I thought, huh, that's me. So I, I took a trip down to Wise. I, I, I knew I couldn't get down there back in the day, so I rented a hotel room, stayed overnight, went to hear Brent speak. And he went down and he listed the symptoms and I'll go over some things in a few moments with you about that. And I'm going, got that, got that, got that, got that, got that. So after he finished speaking, Never having met the man before, I went up to him and I put my arms around his neck and gave him a kiss on the cheek and I said, I think you just diagnosed what's wrong with me. And that was when I then went back to the doctors and began this search to find a doctor who was willing to give me a trial of the medication 
which the fourth doctor did. As I said, uh, at the time, I was, for all intents and purposes, bedridden. I came down the steps sideways with my fingers under the rail because I couldn't hold anything. They were swollen and red and sore. And if I wanted to drink, which I'll do <laughs> at this point, I couldn't hold it like this. I had to hold it like this. So he gave me a prescription. 30 pills. I was to take two of these little pills. They were 0 0.6 milligrams each. And I was to take two of them a day. So I got up after getting the script filled and I took the first pill. And I had been lying on the couch. That basically was what I did most of the day. I could read a little bit, read the paper, read a book, watch a little television. That was about it. And I decided that I wanted to drink of water. And I got up the couch and was halfway across the living room, going toward the kitchen, before I went, ah, the pain is lessened. It's not, I got up off the couch and went, ah, ah, ah. And I thought, okay, now this is in your head. There is no way that that little tiny pill could make a difference in that short time. It's been maybe an hour, two hours since I take it. So I did not say a word to anybody. I thought, you know, everybody, they're really going to think I'm crazy. I mean, if I say this little tiny pill has done anything for me. I waited two weeks. And my family was beginning to notice that they, they had at that time, they believed that I was lazy, that I was a hypochondriac. Um, you know, all of these things, you know, which were breaking my heart. And, you know, I don't blame them. I mean, if you've got 17 different things wrong with you and taking this handful of medication, how can you believe anything else? You know, nobody's going to have 17 <coughs> different diseases all involved. So two weeks later, I had an appointment with the doctor. And I went back in. And he came in. I was sitting in a chair. And he said, well, get up on the table. I got up out of the chair and I stepped up on the little step and I sat down on the table and he looked at me and he said, the nurses had to help you up on the table the last time you were in here. You couldn't get up on your own. And I said, that's exactly right. And he said, have you been taking that culture scene? I said, yes, I've taken it regularly. And I said, the, the difference. It was, it, it was a miracle pill for me. Now, it's not going to work for everybody. It doesn't do you know, things for anybody who has some other diseases. But for us who have this inherited illness, it is a miracle. And the thing that I firmly believe, my opinion, is that this disease is not rare. It has just been misdiagnosed as everything under the sun because the doctors are not taught about it in medical school. I've had one doctor told me he, he had heard, he remember reading a paragraph about it when he was in medical school. We are not teaching our doctors about it. We have folks in this valley who are Italian. We have folks who are of Jewish ancestry. We have folks who are of Arab ancestry. We have people who came from the Slavic countries. We have folks from Greece, all around. We, this, this valley is a, a cosmopolitan valley. There are people with ancestries from lots of Mediterranean places. And we have just as many folks who have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia as there are different varieties of ethnicities. And fibromyalgia is a set of symptoms. It is not a disease. I have found several things that can cause this set of symptoms called fibromyalgia, including my illness, and that was one of the diagnoses that I had. And I no longer have fibromyalgia. The colchicine has taken care of that part of my illness. I have other symptoms, and I get sick every so often. Uh, if there's no cure, there's just a control. Um, when I first found out about this, uh, they were doing research at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And I was very lucky to get an appointment with Dr. Dan Kastner, who is 
now over the whole thing out there at NIH. Uh, but he was the head researcher for familial Mediterranean fever at that time. They had found four genes, and this was about close up to nine years ago, I think. They had found four genes that caused this illness. So he agreed to see me, and I went. I, I spent one whole day at NIH, the, saw I don't know how many doctors. Uh, they took 14 vials of blood from me, a urinalysis, a biopsy, uh, gave me a turkey sandwich and an orange. I, I, as I said, you know, there were interviews with doctors. I mean, you know, just one right after the other, an hour with this doctor, an hour with that doctor, an hour with the other. Also had to do an hour with the psychiatrist. So he, he agreed that it was not in my head as well. So they, they tested those four genes. Everything came back negative. But the thing is, that long before there was genetic testing, familial Mediterranean fever was a clinical diagnosis based upon the symptoms that you had and your positive response to colchicine. And boy, had I had a positive response to colchicine. My symptoms were there. The thing about the disease is that it varies from person to person. It'll be, part of it will be more serious for one person than it is for another. And so it, that makes it all as well, because we don't know about it, because the symptoms are somewhat different, it makes it hard to diagnose. So now, approximately nine years later, and from those four genes, they have 217 genes that they found can cause this illness called familial Mediterranean fever. It's caused by mutations. We don't really know. Sometimes mutations can be caused by environmental factors. Um, sometimes it's just an, an, an embryo where there's a, a, a mutation that happens randomly. Um, but this one appears to, uh, they originally thought, to take a gene from both parents to have it. You can have one gene and be a carrier, but not symptomatic. But they are now finding some people who have only the one gene and they are symptomatic. But what they're not knowing is whether or not those folks just have a gene they haven't found yet. And I, I don't intend to go back, aside from the fact they're still not testing for all 217 genes. And because I've had such a positive response, I don't intend to go back and do genetic testing again. But it was very, very interesting to be there and to see what was going on. I have researched several different Illnesses, the sarcoidosis I told you about, the familial Mediterranean fever I told you about. There is also a disease called Bessette's syndrome, B-E-H-C-E-T apostrophe S. They are now thinking that Bessette's may be a subset of familial Mediterranean fever. It has quite a few different symptoms, but it also responds to consciousness. One of the ways that is very easy to tell whether anybody has this. It's not a sexually transmitted disease, but it causes both oral and genital ulcers. And there, you can get on the internet, look under images, and find some of those things. Oh, have mercy. That must be the most painful thing in the whole world. Those ulcers can go all the way down your intestinal tract. So I've, I've only known a couple of and I have not seen them when they were in their flare or execration. <laughs> I, I, you know, I really feel for them. Uh, the other disease actually is a set of diseases called thalassemia, T-H-A-L-A-S-S-E-M-I-A. -S -S -E and there are half a dozen or more forms of thalassemia. It's a form of anemia. Uh, you can have a mild form of this and just be mildly anemic or you can have a serious um, form and just uh, have really, really severe symptoms and death. Um, thalassemia is, is easily diagnosed by blood tests. But most of us, if we go to the doctor and the doctor says we're anemic, he gives us iron. And that has absolutely no use for anybody who has one of the thalassemias. The folks who have the most severe have to have blood transfusions. 
Uh, there's not for some of the ones with the very mild. There's not much that they can do. Relieve a little bit of pain with something from the symptoms. Uh, I have a bunch of my URLs and other folks' URLs um, that are on the net. Um, one of the things is a Jewish genetic disease site. And as I said, I had no idea that I had any Jewish ancestry until the DNA showed the possibility that there was Jewish ancestry. Folks with Jewish ancestry get familial Mediterranean fever and a whole lot of other inheritable illnesses. So whether you know that you have Jewish ancestry or not, it probably would be worthwhile if you look into some of those and look at some of the symptoms uh, that come. Uh, I also have an, uh, a URL for you on congenital and inherited disorder, uh, disorders. And I put some of my Melungeon URLs on there for you uh, if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about that group of people. Um, I, I believe that they were in the Appalachian Mountain Ranges, um, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia, uh, very, very early on. Uh, I believe that they were found on the white people living there. Uh, there are some instances where we have um, some records that say that they were living in log houses uh, that had very peculiar arch windows to them. And if you look into a research architecture at any point, an arch is not an American architectural thing. Some of our ancestors made lovely quilts that had arched pieces to it. And that, that house had arched windows. It came from the Mediterranean. That is a Mediterranean architectural feature. There are a lot of things that can give you. Um, my family would never eat fish and milk together. My mother swore up and down that it would kill me. I think that is a holdover from the Jewish custom of separating milk and meat. I don't have any proof of that, but that to me is the, the best thing that I can think of. My mother cleaned her house, and she cleaned from the outside walls to the center of the room, and she swept up any dust or particles and, and took them out. No dirt or dust was ever swept over the threshold, and that's another Jewish custom that can be found uh, cultural. So you need to also, besides looking at DNA, you need to look at some cultural things that were handed down in your family. Now I'm going to tell you one thing, and if anybody's ever heard of it, let me know because I've never found a single person that ever had this custom in their family. On New Year's Eve, we took a quarter or a 50 cent piece or a silver dollar, and we took it outside the house and we hid it. This had to happen before 12 midnight. Any time after 12 midnight, even the next morning, we went out and we brought our silver piece in. And that was to represent bringing in income into the family for the upcoming new year. Now, my grandmother also swore that there was gypsy blood in our family. Yeah, I wonder. Irish gypsy blood. Except they did it cabbage. Okay. Out of the cabbage. Right. So this is, this is the, the thing, you know, that you need to look around. That's, that's fine. Um, I want to give some time for questions. Let me just finish up a little bit here with a couple of things. Uh, I, I have a uh, link to some old-fashioned medical terminology. I think I mentioned that. I also have a link to some ads that were early on in the United States for weed, booze, cocaine, and other old school medicine ads. So you may find those fascinating to look at and see what they thought. You know, take cocaine, take heroin, it'll make you have a beautiful pale complexion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let me see if I play. Oh, okay, well, I want to just end with this, the specific symptoms of familial Mediterranean fever. There are seven of them, and this is, you do not have to have all seven of the symptoms at the same time. Uh, you can have one or two, uh, it, it just depends in, in different people, okay? The first is an abdominal attack 
that is very similar to either abdomen appendicitis or gallbladder. I had both my appendix and my gallbladder removed because of this pain in my side. And continued after the surgery for over and done. Uh, joint attacks, basically occurring in the larger joints, your legs, knees, hips, but also can be in, as I said, my thumb was so sore I couldn't use it. Um, many of the folks with this are diagnosed as having rheumatoid arthritis because the blood test for rheumatoid arthritis, which rises when you, are, when you have it, also rises when you have a flare of familial Mediterranean fever. And this is why I could go in one time and the doctor would say, well, no, you don't have it. And the next time I go in and say, well, yeah, you do. Because as long as I was not flaring with this illness, that, that blood test was so normal. The minute I got into a flare, I went to the doctor's office, and he said, yep, all right. Okay, you have chest attacks. Uh, that can be pleuritis. Now, that's an inflammation of the pleural lining of the body. Uh, one of the more rare symptoms is pericarditis, and that's the sac that goes around your heart, and that can become inflamed. Uh, they, they say that pleuritis occurs in about 40% of the people who have this illness. It hurts to breathe. It feels like your breastbone is broken. It's uh, really, really severe pain. Uh, you can have tennis elbow. I mean, yeah, all of these things can be brought on. Uh, in males, there are scrotal attacks. That must be terrifically horrible. There is myalgia. And this is the fibromyalgia as uh, part of the diagnosis. And there is medical documentation that says that the set of symptoms called fibromyalgia are a part of the symptoms of familial Mediterranean fever. There are a couple of other diseases that can cause those symptoms. Hemochromatosis, which is too much iron in the blood. You go to the Red Cross and you donate blood, and that takes care of that. Your fibromyalgia goes away. There's that thing that goes on the back of your head. Oh, I've forgotten what it's called now. But the, the, the brain kind of slips down into the spinal cord area, and it can cause fibromyalgia symptoms. That can be operated on. It's closed up, the brain's pushed back up, and your fibromyalgia goes away. Uh, there's also a disease called Wilson's disease that can cause fibromyalgia. Uh, I still research every now and then. I haven't found <clears throat> any specific uh, other diseases at this point, although there are some things that are pointing to different ones for that. That is, I guess, my pet peeve. I, I lived with a fibromyalgia diagnosis for 30 years, getting worse every time. Uh, there is a skin reaction that looks almost like baby's heat rash. Uh, it, it appears most frequently on your ankles. But it can be any place. It can be on your face. It can be on your chest. Um, and you can have a fever with this without any of these symptoms. You just have a fever. And this is a lot of a baby start out this way. You know, babies have unknown symptoms. Anybody else got a question? Yes. Is that what uh, that was used for with gown? Yes. Yes. And the, as I said, the pharaohs, the doctors to the pharaohs gave it to them. They had arthritic type symptoms, you know, in their big toe and, you know, elbows and other things like that. So it was for joint pain and uh, made from the autumn crocus, the flower. And it is toxic. You have to be careful with it. You have to take the prescribed doses. <laughs> and we are, our blood is tested about twice a year to make sure that we're not getting too much of it in there. As long as you don't, then you're just fine. My doctor here allows me to tell her what I need. Uh, it, it's, it's very nice. Uh, I, you know, I took my DNA into her. I took the prescriptions that I had been taking uh, from my previous residence. Uh, I, I told her what I had, and um, I said, you know, will you continue these prescriptions for me? Uh, you know, I can't be without them. I think I would be dead now. And so she has allowed me. Now, I've had some heart problems. I had to have stents put in my heart. That may have come from inflammation.
because this is, it, it, it affects every part of your body and may have come earlier from part of the inflammation. What about but the valves to your heart? They are okay. Uh, just had the stent put in to, to they said it was 90% closed and I couldn't have a heart attack and it's on. <coughs> Can I ask you this also? When you were at your worst, could you climb stairs? Oh, I, I, you know, I had to. I had to pull myself upstairs, one step, one foot at a time, and moan and groan. And I mean, you would have. I felt like I was dying. I really did. The pain was off. And as I said, it went from the tip of my ear to the tip of my toes. Um, just you know, swollen joints, muscle pain, the stomach pain. And because of the stomach pain, it, it, it inflames. You would also sometimes have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, all that nice stuff that goes along with that. So these symptoms can you know, really be wide and varied. Okay. Yes? I just wanted to thank you for uh, talking uh, so much about a subject that a lot of people are very interested about. You know, And I wanted to point out, uh, my name is Greg Carroll. I work here as a historian. I've studied the Melungeon issue also and spoken at the Melungeon conference that was in uh, Logan County a couple of years ago. We have several books on the Melungeons right up here in this section here. We also have some books by Kennedy here also. We have some of his work. And uh, I also wanted to mention about the Lumbees because you said you maybe were connected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there is a whole variety of interesting interconnections with the Lumbees because they uh, may have been a, a connected to the, the Croatan Indians and the Indians that were mixed with the Lost Colony people. So there's an interesting connection there. There's also a connection with Melungeon people to the original Jamestown colony. And those folks were captured by Portuguese, well, they were slaves by, well, of Portuguese folks, and then they were captured by some Dutch pirates and taken to Jamestown. So right off the bat, you have Portuguese people who had a colony in Africa who had interbred with their slaves there who were sending slaves over. So there's all kinds of interesting possible connections culturally and you know DNA wise to uh, that Melungeon people. The Melungeon you know can be studied here, and folks can you know easily come and take a look at some of the stuff we have here too. Thank you so much. That's really wonderful. Certainly. Um, I, I'll tell you just a, a quick story about the, the Melungeon and the Jamestown. Um, I, had, I lived in Richmond, Virginia for a while. I had a friend who teased me to death. He said, Nancy, you really surprised me. And I said, I surprise you? Why? Why? He said, you don't walk with a limp. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're from West Virginia, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> well, you walked around the side of those mountains all these years. How did you not? Well, you know, of course, I couldn't let it go with that. So I, it took me a while. I thought, thought. So I told him, he said, you know, all those folks that landed down there in Jamestown? Oh, yeah, he said, down in Jamestown, Virginia, yeah, start of our country. I said, well, when they landed, there was a sign on the beach that said, this way to West Virginia, and all them that could read went. <laughs> <laughs> to either Native Americans, Melungeons, right. or mixed ancestry. Right. And um, that was related to Reckett and Armada. Oh. And had the uh, had German and English mm -hmm. and what have you also. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was better to have be called Black Dutch yeah. uh, than it was to be called any of those other things back in those time periods. Yeah. You know, you, 
you got yourself thrown out of school, you got yourself thrown out of being able to vote, and all those good things. The thing also goes back to the Hatfield side of, of uh, yeah. here in West Virginia. The Hatfields, if you trace them, they go back to England. And uh, they had a large manor in the state there at one time. And the first uh, 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 section or something was going and seized their property. And then the king, he got picked off the church and he threw them out and he took over the property. And that's where I think the queen mother was when she was 18 and uh, was a uh, crown. I think she was living. She was living there in the Hatfield Estate at that time. It's really, it's really interesting when you get into that. Oh, there is. That's documented here in books. There is, I believe, one of the list of common surnames from the legends. You can find that on the internet too. Uh, that's what happened with my Remy Remy family. I have traced them, the Remys, from France here and when they they became rainy and they were in the southwest Virginia and into Kentucky and we believe that there was a connection to the Melungeons and the rainy surname became one of the common surnames amongst Melungeons. Just because you have a common surname doesn't mean that, that there is actually a connection that they made. I'm not saying it's an almost thing to wear it's dark. It's dark all year round so say you yeah. <laughs> we went to Myrtle Beach, and our family is fairly fair, and we had a picture taken. When we got home, we looked, and here was this black person in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> My hair was much longer and very curly. The longer it gets, the curlier it gets. And I tan very easily. Fascinating subject, DNA and uh, genealogy and inheritable illnesses. And I hope that uh, I've given you all something to think about and that you will go home and think about doing some research on your own family trees uh, to see what the medical history. Uh, as I said, three generations is very good. If you can get the fourth, that's fantastic. And some of us can't. I have a string of uh, handouts up here. Just take one of each if you want to. And uh, thank you so much. For that. intermediate price, it runs because depending on what you do, about a couple hundred dollars generally for the basic uh, thing. And um, I got my first DNA as a Christmas present, so. I want to thank you all for coming, and I tell you, this, uh, this presentation I think is one of the most interesting presentations I've ever witnessed. My past, if I had one, would be all <laughs> And uh, thanks for coming. Be sure you get the handouts, and I'm sure Nancy will answer any last minute questions. My, my address, my e address is on there, my telephone number is on there.